Good morning, and welcome to virtual Sunday worship here at First Parish in Framingham. I am the Reverend Aaron Stockwell, Senior Minister, and it is my honor and joy to serve this congregation. Unitarian Universalism is a faith for all souls. It doesn't matter your skin color, your age, where you came from, your gender, who you love, or how you move in the world. It doesn't matter if you watch our services on your laptop, on a desktop, on a tablet, a smartphone, or a smart TV. And it doesn't matter if those devices use Roku, iOS, Windows, or a Linux piece of software. It doesn't matter if you put your marshmallows on top of your sweet potatoes, or if a turkey, a tofurkey, or a lasagna is at the center of your Thanksgiving table. What matters, dear one, is that you are here watching this service. You are a part of this community. It matters that you affirm and promote the worth and dignity of all. So wherever you are in life's journey, dear one, you are welcome here. This morning, we observe and explore the holiday of Thanksgiving from many different angles. This is an intentionally multi-generational service. So if you get the wiggles at some point, feel free to get up and stretch. That's the beauty of gathering virtually. We will never know. The chancel flowers this morning are given by the Merson family in gratitude to birth parents who have chosen adoption. November is National Adoption Awareness Month. Thank you to the Merson family for this beautiful bouquet of flowers. Immediately following the service will be our Zoom coffee hour. Also, this week there will be two opportunities to gather on Zoom on Thanksgiving Day. So if you're feeling, like a lot of us, that this holiday is especially strange, you're feeling lonely and you are seeking connection with other first parishioners, be sure to join us. They'll be at 1 p.m. and 7 p.m. on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, you can look for more of the details on that uh, in the care post emails. for our chalice lighting are the global chalice lighting for November 2020. They were written by Daniel Faria, a lay leader with the Portuguese language Unitarian Universalist Alliance. We light this chalice as a symbol of faith, hope, and love. To face the shadows, a chalice of light. To face inequity, a justice of chalice to face falsehood, a chalice of truth, to face evil, a chalice of goodness, to face disharmony, a chalice of beauty. May your brightness, manifestation of the infinite light, bless our hearts, our spirits, and our lives. During this time where we are gathering apart, it is crucial to have rituals that we do at the same time. Because when we do a ritual at the same time, it plays a little bit of a trick on our brains. Our brains think that we are actually together. So as the children of this congregation light the chalice, and as I light the chalice here in the sanctuary, I invite you to light a candle at home. 
and to type into the chat box, the chalice is lit in my home or the chalice is lit in our home. Here we are. It is Zoom's giving. Yeah, you know, it's it's not really quite what I had imagined or hoped for. But, you know, here we are alone in our own spaces. Yeah, uh, speaking of space, did you know that the first Thanksgiving in space happened in 1973 with astronauts Gerald Carr, William Pogue, and Edward Gibson on board the Skylab space station. They ate a Thanksgiving meal. Uh, the last several years on Thanksgiving morning, I've run a 5K race. Those <laughs> astronauts went on a six hour spacewalk before they had Thanksgiving. Um, That's crazy. Yeah, since, uh, since 2000, there's been a Thanksgiving feast on the International Space Station. Uh, Nathan Sharping wrote about their food. Uh, Though it may come in portion controlled and irradiated uh, foil packets, the astronauts have been treated to smoked turkey, uh, mashed potatoes, no turkey, uh, no gravy, unfortunately, uh, candied yams, green beans, cornbread dressing, and occasionally a special dessert that's been brought up by newcomers to the space station. Uh, The astronauts hook up those packets Uh, to a special machine that rehydrates them and creates something that's edible. Uh, By all (laughs) accounts, the food tastes pretty good, um, although eating in zero gravity presents its own problems. Instead of spilling gravy on the carpet, astronauts have to worry about their stuffing escaping and hitting them in the eye. Um, (laughs) And so, you know, uh, one of the things that when they were designing the International Space Station, actually, uh, they weren't sure if they needed a table because you can't really set plates down on anything. Um, <laughs> sure. So uh, someone, uh, Mike Landman, which is a funny name, I think, for someone who's writing about space, uh, said, with no gravity, food won't stay on the table any more than silverware or cups. Uh, Even the astronauts need to be tethered to stay in place. So from a purely scientific and technical viewpoint, a table is wasted space. But the astronaut said, basically, look, if we have to eat this stuff that passes as food, could you at least provide us with some way to enjoy the communal aspect of eating together? Funny stuff. That makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, I had no idea. That's really out of this world. (laughs) Ah. Ah, man. Well, Zoom's giving, I suppose that we should probably tell, you know, the Thanksgiving story, the one about the pilgrims and the Native Americans and how they helped them survive the really long cold winter. You know the story and how it goes. Yeah, about that. I'm sorry, do you not know the story? Oh my gosh, okay. So we used to tell it every year when I was growing up. In 1620, there's this group of pilgrims, they were from England, or was it, no, they were from Holland. No, it doesn't matter. Anyway, they were coming over because no, they I, were I, really it. I know the story, I'm, I'm just saying, I don't think it's really the story we ought to be telling right now. What are you talking about It's Thanksgiving? Well, one of my friends, uh, he serves a congregation in Chicago, uh, wrote this this reading, and it really explains a lot about Thanksgiving and how we celebrate it. 
I'd love to hear it. Okay, it's it's a little complicated. Do you want to work through it as a uh, as we go along? Okay, yeah, let's let's work it out together. Go for it. Cool. All right. Um, in uh, oh, I need to make that just a little bit larger. Uh, so, <laughs> okay, here goes. Uh, we gather at Thanksgiving in some sense to retell the creation myth of our country. And this myth is our very best and our very worst, a boldness, a care for the common good, a wish to say we before I. Yet from even before that first Thanksgiving feast, it's a story of theft and violence, a ruthlessly narrow definition of who we really means. Wow. That's pretty deep. You know, I, I think what he's trying to say is that the story that we tell at Thanksgiving, the one that I started to tell is, you know, it's kind of like a, like a myth about how the United States got started. It's a story that we will want to be true. And we think it showcases the best of who we are as Americans. But yeah, you know, as I'm hearing this, it's kind of only just told from one point of view from the pilgrims. And therefore, you know, from white people as a whole. All right, what does it say next? Okay, so after that, David writes, the colonists had come seeking freedom, and we identify with them in that. But it was freedom only for themselves. In every generation forward from this, from that day to this, the people living in this land that became America struggled always with the question, who is freedom really for? Okay, all right. So the colonists that he's talking about, those are the pilgrims. And they came seeking freedom, right, right, free, right, freedom to practice their religions. I remember that part. And then I think what he's saying is that we can all identify with that, with that, that hope that we're all seeking freedom and we all want to be free, but they were really only thinking about it for themselves, weren't they? Not for other people. Like, like maybe not for the people who were already living on this land. Okay, so now people who are not white then are wondering if that same freedom that we talk about in that story extends to them as well. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Let's, let's read on. So uh, black persons were taken from their native Africa to become slaves. Immigration laws were written explicitly to prohibit non-Western uh, Europeans. Women could not vote even a century ago. Uh, in many states right now, gay and lesbian people can be legally fired or evicted merely for not being straight. Refugees knock and in response, voices call to bar the door. Yeah, I think we're onto something here. That freedom in that story was really only for white, straight, guys huh hmm. it sounds like like everyone else has struggled in this history of america you know black people who were made to be slaves and and people from other countries who were seeking a better life and women and gay and lesbian folks and refugees none of them get to be free the way that the pilgrims said it was going to be for everyone yeah now now the reading starts to quote a universalist minister. Here's what it says. Universalist minister Clarence Skinner wrote, the fight for freedom is never won. Every generation must win for itself the right to emancipate itself from its own tyrannies, which are ever unprecedented. Therefore, those who've been reared in freedom bear a tremendous responsibility to the world to win an ever larger and more important liberty. Yeah, so so those of us who have any kind of freedoms, we're responsible for making sure that it gets extended to other people who maybe don't have that same kind of privilege. And it's something we have to just keep working on. It doesn't just happen once and then we get it for good. We gotta keep working for it. Yeah, we're, we're coming to the end on the, on the reading. It continues like this. So may it be for us. We are the inheritors of our liberty, one with sweat and labor and blood of generations before us, 
May we be a people committed to winning an ever larger liberty for the generations that follow. Who is freedom for? May we answer today and always, every one of us. Yeah, may we be a people committing and committed to winning freedom for every one of us. the Thanksgiving story because it's filled and riddled with problems the way we've always told it, then what are the stories that we should be telling? Because Thanksgiving is full of stories and freedom is for everyone. So I'm gonna share a story with you this morning called How Many Days to America, a Thanksgiving story. It's written by Eve Bunting and illustrated by Beth Peck. It was nice in our village till the night in October when the soldiers came. My mother hid my little sister and me under the bed. When I peered out, I could see my mother's feet in their black slippers and the great muddy boots of the soldiers. When they were gone, my father said, we must leave right now. Why? I asked. Because we do not think the way they think, my son. Hurry. He would not let us take anything but a change of clothes. My mother cried, leave all my things, my chair where I sat to nurse our children, the bed cover that my mother made, every stitch by hand, nothing my father said, just money to buy our way to America. The word America was not new to me. I had heard it whispered between my parents in the restless hours of the night. America, were we going there? Others too moved silently along the secret streets. Boats bobbed in the dark water off the quay, and men talked behind their hands while gold passed from one pocket to another. I must have your wedding ring, my father told my mother, and your garnets. My mother took the ring from her finger and the garnet necklace from its little bag buried deep in her bundle. She did not speak. My father said we would leave while it was still dark, how many days to America? My little sister asked. Not many, my father said. Don't be afraid. The fishing boat was small and there were many people. More kept coming and more. We chugged heavily from harbor to open ocean. Can we see America yet, Papa? All the time, my little sister asks questions. Not yet my father said. We were an hour from shore 
when the motors stopped. The men crowded the engines. A part is broken that cannot be fixed, my father told my mother, and her face twisted the way it did when she closed the door of our home for the last time. The women made a sail by knotting clothes together, and when they pulled it high, I saw my father's Sunday shirt blowing in the wind. But the sail carried us back toward our own shore, and men shot at us from the cliffs. At last, we got the boat turned in the right direction. How many days to America now? My little sister asked. More, my small one, my father said, and he held us close. I saw him look at my mother across our heads. Day followed night and night day. Our food and water ran out and many people were sick. At sunset, my father and mother and sister and I huddled in the bow. Then my father sang as he sang at home. Sleep and dream, tomorrow comes and we shall all be free. That was the only time I was not afraid. By day, we fished and shared the catch. When it rained, we caught the water in our buckets. I slept and dreamed of home, of food, of my favorite uncle who worked with my father in his shop and who had stayed behind. Sometimes I cried and then my mother would rock me against her. Once we saw a whale, gray as an elephant and covered with barnacles. Come push us, whale, my mother called. Push us to America. But the whale did not hear. Once a boat came, roaring close on wings of foam, and we were filled with joy, but not for long. Thieves, fear moved like a bad wind between us. Men scrambled from the other boat to ours, waving their guns and shouting for money and jewels. There was little to take, but what we had went with them. Once there was a shout of land and we crowded the railing, but though we pulled on the sail, our boat would go no closer. We will swim for help, my father said, and he and two others jumped into the water. No, my mother cried but they were gone already. When at last we saw them rise on the green roll of the surf, saw them carried to shore, we danced and cheered, but there were soldiers on the rocks. Everyone was quiet and my mother gripped my hand. They are bringing them back, she whispered. The soldiers with rifles came too in the small boat. They brought us water and fruit but they did not speak or smile as they tossed it up to our waiting hands. Was it not the right land, Papa? I asked as the soldiers pulled away. Will it not do? It would do, but they will not take us, my father said. My sister tugged at his arm. They don't like us? It's not that. He did not explain what it was. Our family got two papayas and three lemons and a coconut with milk that tasted like flowers. The sea was rough that night and my father's song lost itself in the wind. I said the words as the stars dipped and turned above our heads. Tomorrow comes, tomorrow comes, and we shall all be free. It was the next day, the tomorrow, that we sighted land again. I was too afraid to hope. A boat came. My mother clasped her hands and bent her head. Was she afraid to hope too? The boat circled us twice and then a line was thrown and we were pulled to shore. There was such a silence among us then, such an anxious, watchful silence. People waited on the dock. Welcome. They called, welcome to America. That was when our silence turned to cheers. But how did they know we would come today? My father asked. Perhaps people come every day, my mother said. Perhaps they understand how it is for us. There was a shed 
warm from the sun on its tin roof. There were tables covered with food. Though the benches were crowded, there soon was room for all of us. Do you know what day this is? A woman asked me. She passed me a dinner plate. It is the coming to America day, I said. She smiled. Yes, and it's special for another reason too. Today is Thanksgiving. What is that? My little sister was shy, but not too shy to ask her questions. Long ago, unhappy people came here to start new lives, the woman said. They celebrated by giving thanks. My father nodded. That is the only true way to celebrate. We joined hands and closed our eyes while my father gave thanks that we were free and safe and here. Can we stay, Papa? My little sister asked. Yes, small one, my father said. We can stay. So there is a Thanksgiving story, much like the first. Unhappy people crossing an ocean to find freedom. But in this case, let it be us who passes that freedom on to others. Let it be us that provides freedom for all people in America. To this tapestry of a community, we each bring our joys and our sorrows, our milestones, happy and sad occasions. We know that joy shared is joy expanded and sorrow shared can feel as though someone is lifting a burden. There will be prompts on the screen that will give better order to our sharing. Do remember this, friends. In this virtual space, privacy cannot be guaranteed. So do feel free to get in touch with me if there is something a little too tender to share that you wish to let me and others know about. <laughs> Is a love holding me. There is a love holding all that I love. There is a love holding all I rest in.
We are out in uh, near the community garden, out behind One Ton Edgel Road. We're going to share a prayer uh, by the Reverend Max Coots, who served congregations in New York State. Uh, it's a wonderful prayer that has some uh, props to go along with it. Let us give thanks for a bounty of people. For children who are our second planting, and though they grow like weeds, and the wind too soon blows them away, may they forgive us our cultivation and fondly remember where their roots are. For generous friends with hearts and smiles as bright as flower blossoms. Do you want to read this one? Maybe alternate? Sure. Where are we? There we go. For feisty friends. For feisty friends as tart as apples. For continuous friends who, like scallions and cucumbers, keep reminding us that we've had them. For crotchety friends as sour as rhubarb, and as indestructible. There is no rhubarb <laughs> in the grocery stores. <laughs> uh, for handsome friends who are as gorgeous as eggplants and as elegant as a row of corn and the others plain as potatoes and as good for you. For funny friends who are silly as Brussels sprouts and as amusing as Jerusalem artichokes, and serious friends as complex as cauliflowers and as intricate as onions. For friends as unpretentious as cabbages, as subtle as summer squash, as persistent as parsley, as delightful as dill, as endless as zucchini, who, like parsnips, can be counted on to see you through the winter. For old friends nodding like sunflowers in the every t evening time, and young friends coming on fast as radishes. For loving friends who wind around us like tendrils and hold us despite our blights, our wilts, and our witherings. And finally, for those friends now gone, like the gardens past that have been harvested and who fed us in their time, that we might have life thereafter. For all these, we give thanks.
Friends, the ongoing ministry of this congregation in our time of virtual gathering depends deeply on your generosity. My colleague, the Reverend Kayla Parker, writes these words. We know that our financial contributions to this congregation come from sacrifice and hard work. We are so grateful for this and commit together to ensure the funds we gather collectively do a greater good for ourselves and for our world than they could have done alone. May there be an offering to sustain and grow the life and the mission of this congregation. May we grow in love and in hope. And because we are not passing plates around on a Sunday morning, be sure to follow the directions that are on the screen right now so that you can arrange to make a donation. If you don't want to give electronically, be sure to write a check and send it off to First Parish in Framingham. The morning offering will now be joyfully given and gratefully received. Dear ones, I do not have to tell you that this Thanksgiving season this year is a Thanksgiving unlike any that we have experienced before. You know this deep in your bones how different this holiday is. So I don't have to tell you. I've been thinking a little bit about the stoles that I wear over my robe. Stoles are an ancient uh, religious symbol that's about service, actually. And I have stoles of many different colors. I have this one right here for Christmas. I have this one right here for officiating at weddings and some special events or memorial services. And on the inside is blue, a lovely blue batik, which I take out for the water ceremony and sometimes for Advent. I, of course, have this beautiful stole to celebrate the diversity that exists in our world. I have this soul, stole, which 
is simple, but it is made out of the fabric that hangs at the back of First Parish of Groton. Whenever I wear this, I feel connected to the congregation that ordained me and where I joined and first was introduced to Unitarian Universalism. It has my ordination date on the back there. Our Christian siblings and Christian siblings who are in the clergy uh, have a very elaborate code of liturgical colors. Um, right now, our friends who would be across the street at Plymouth Congregational Church uh, would likely be wearing this green. Green is the color that symbolizes a time in their liturgical calendar called ordinary time. And sometimes I like to follow the way that they switch up the colors. Ordinary time is the time that is usually before Advent, before the preparation for Jesus' birth, and a couple of other times during the year. So they're wearing this right now, the last moment of ordinary time. But I don't think we're living in any ordinary time. Feels extra ordinary and extraordinary. As we are entering into a season of tradition, where we want to do the things that we have always done, and we learn that we cannot, we struggle. I'm, I'm struggling. I so want to see this sanctuary filled with your faces, filled with candlelight as we sing Silent Night. I so want to see how we do a Christmas pageant here. I so want to smell the candles right after we blow them out. I so want all of that, but I know that I can't. I wanted to travel to see family and friends, but Christmas, Thanksgiving is gonna look a little bit smaller. I say this every year around the holidays about how we are sometimes bound by tradition. Sometimes that tradition doesn't feed us. It doesn't serve us in the same way. Perhaps this is the year that we let go of our expectations. We let go of the need to recreate things the way that they've always been done because it's not going to be that way. And I know for many of you, this is going to be a difficult or different Thanksgiving. You're not gonna be able to gather together in person. A child isn't going to be there for Thanksgiving dinner. A loved one who has died over the last year isn't going to be there. And this is going to be the first Thanksgiving or the first Christmas or the first Kwanzaa, Solstice, New Year's, Hanukkah, without them. It's going to be different. Everybody's holiday this year is going to be different. And I think the thing that is powerful here is everybody's first new Thanksgiving or first new holiday is scary. It's the first time, but you know what, friends? We only have to do the first fill in the blank once. Because after that, the situation has changed and maybe it's gone back to the way it once was. Or we've already had that first event after a change. And we know what we need. We know what we need from that holiday for it to feel special. That's my message to you. Use this as a time to let go 
of expectation. Use it as the first time. And yes, first times are scary. But the truth is after that, it can be easier. Those expectations of all the food that we want to have, the friends that we want to see, yes, it, it is important and there are ways to connect. But let go of some of that expectation. It's fine if you don't cook dinner the same way. You have never lived through a global pandemic. It is fine. It is fine. You, dear one, are doing a great job. Let us remember this. When our humanity is showing, when we feel, and when it seems like we're not living up to our own expectations or the expectations of others, hear that whisper in your ear. You, dear one, are doing a great job or a good job. May it be so, and amen. Gather the spirit, harvest the heart, our separate fires with kindle Witness the mystery of this heart, my faith in this life appear all the same. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion and strength, gather to celebrate once again. Gather the spirit of heart and mind, seeds for the sowing are laid in store, nurtured in love and conscience refined, with body and spirit united once more. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, Gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion, and strength. Gather in celebrate once again. Gather the spirit growing in us, drawn by the moon and fed by the sun. Winter to spring. And summer to fall, the chorus of life resounding as one. Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion and strength, gather to celebrate once again. send you off with these words of benediction by the Reverend Wayne Arneson, who writes, Take courage, friends. The way is often hard. The path is never clear, and the stakes are very high. Take courage, for deep down, deep down there is another truth. You are not alone. I now invite you to extinguish the flames you have lit in your homes as I extinguish the flame of our chalice. As the flame goes out, let the smoke waft through the air for just a moment. And I invite you to type into the chat box, I carry the flame.